So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about different kinds of wind turbines, and specifically how they work, how they make electricity. And there's two main styles that we'll learn about. One of them is called a horizontal axis wind turbine, which is the most popular and effective. And another is called a vertical axis wind turbine, which, as you'll read, Paul Guyp doesn't care much for them. Not because he's biased against them, but because they don't have a proven level of performance. So, the vertical axis turbine has some real benefits. One of them is that it can accept the wind coming from any direction, and the generator can be mounted at ground level. There are both lift and drag styles of this, whereas the horizontal axis machines, they have to find and follow the wind. And they can do this a couple ways. They can do this either with what's known as an active yaw system or a passive yaw system. We'll learn about whether they will operate in an upwind style or a downwind style. Horizontal axis machines, for the most part, are lift type machines. On the vertical axis machines, this is known as the orientation that they have. You can see that there's really only one type of, a, of a, a vertical axis machine that uses lift, and that's the one that's known as the Darius. Uh, there's a, examples of these on page 86 of the textbook, uh, figures 6-3 and 6-4. We can see the various designs. And we're not going to spend as much time on these types of machines as, as you might expect, uh, because for the most part, you're not going to find them working out in industry. There are also some drag type machines. One of them is known as a cup anemometer. Those we actually do use, but we use those for measuring wind speed, not for generating electricity. And the other is called a Savonius, which uh, has a little bit of lift and a little bit of drag. They do have uh, a small amount of uh, usage, um, and we'll see some pictures of that later. Here's, here are a couple of photos. And uh, you'll notice the one on the left here is kind of uh, unique looking. Um, and you can see it acts like a cup anemometer on the top. And the wind will grab into those cups and spin it around. Those are drag machines. And by drag machines, specifically what I mean is the blades will never move faster than the wind. On the right side, however, we see one of the Darius machines. And you can get an idea for how large it is by looking at the size of the pickup trucks there on the bottom. So that's a pretty big machine. And the generator's literally sitting right on the ground. And as that shaft spins around, that's going to cause the generator to convert the mechanical energy into an electrical energy. But you'll also notice that it's got guy wires on it. Without those guy wires, the thing would tip over in the wind. And, uh, and that is one of the huge drawbacks with the vertical axis machines. So the next slide talks about lift and drag, but before we get into that, I want to talk more about the components of the wind turbine themselves. And let's go to Paul's book on page 115 and take a look at a very small turbine that has been around for quite a while. This is known as an Ampere 100, and it's going to, the as we can see the blade here, right, this blade is just one of six that are on it will provide uh, a rotating force on this shaft, and this shaft will cause this armature to create an electromagnetic field, uh, or to turn inside of the electromagnetic field that these windings are creating. And that energy then will be sent through these devices here, right? Those are called slip rings. Those slip rings will allow the energy created by this spinning force to be sent down uh, to charge a battery or to directly um, be used by a device. So this is a small type of horizontal axis machine, very small. This thing is rated for about 130 watts, so that's not very much. Uh, if you look in the back of the textbook on page 425, there's, an in, there's a whole list of all kinds of small wind turbines at, listed by size. And so you can get a lot more information there as far as specifications, when, how much energy they make, when they cut in, when they cut out, and so forth. All right. So I want to point out a couple of things on this. Again, we've got the 
blade spins along the horizontal axis here. So it spins, spins along the horizontal axis, and this large tail that we see here that would be downwind of the blade, um, that tail is what's going to keep the turbine facing into the wind. And this is what we refer to as a passive yaw. So as the wind changes directions, wind changes directions, this tail is going to allow it to rot allow the entire turbine to rotate so that the blade always faces into the wind. I want to point out here that we can see that there's some twist and then some taper on this blade right here, right? We can see that twist and taper. On the next page, we see a couple of larger machines here. Now, these machines, now we're starting to get into machines that can uh, provide enough energy to, to, to uh, power a household. Um, so we can see the one on the left is a 50-foot diameter machine. That's a 50-kilowatt machine. Pretty powerful. Uh, the Entertech E44, there are many, many of these still flying. When we look in th at this image, we can see a couple things here. Number one... The, the, sh the shaft, although the shaft is covered inside this housing, the generator is not. Uh, most turbines have some sort of covering over the top of uh, any sort of a gearbox or, or the generator. And that is referred to as a nacelle. Right? And we can see here that it says this does not have a nacelle. And this is a smaller one right here. This is a 2 kilowatt machine. And uh, you can see it's a two-bladed machine, which uh, actually had worked pretty well. And uh, we can see this is on a monopole type tower, where this is on what they refer to as a lattice type tower. We go a little further on to page 117, and let's, let's see what's going on inside some of the more conventional uh, larger turbines. So this turbine, we can see we've got the blade covered up. Uh, each, each blade is connected to this rotor hub. And that rotor hub connects via a shaft into this, which is a gearbox. So if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you'll see that all the uh, um, components are numbered. So you can look through those. Um, so this particular machine is going to um, have the rotating blade be have its speed increased through this transmission or gearbox which then allows the shaft feeding this is the actual generator that will be spinning at a fast enough speed to generate the electricity that we need um, so you can look this over here's another brand um, and we can see that we've got some cutaway shown here this is an actual an illustration that doesn't give us exactly what we're looking for but we can see the output of the gearbox we see the shaft which is going to then feed the generator which is towards the back end i need to point out a couple things on these drawings we can see we have some masts on the back of the nacelle and we can see we have an anemometer here and a wind vane here and that those two devices are used to determine what the wind speed is and what direction it's coming from. And we can see that there's this large bull ring assembly, okay, or yaw ring, and a motor, an electric motor, number 13 here. So this would be getting information from a controller that's going to determine what direction the turbine is pointing and compare that to the direction that the wind is blowing from. And that will energize this motor to turn the turbine uh, clockwise or counterclockwise so that it faces into the wind. So these are a couple of things that Paul has in his book. Um, and I'm going to turn one more page here because I want to show you uh, the size of some of these large uh, direct drive type machines. Okay, so these, what you see here, these are large windings. And so these will all be wired together in such fashion to generate the size of uh, all, all, of voltage and then the rated power to come up with as they're showing here uh, a 1.8 megawatt ring generator several of those rings will be put together and the rotor then is going to spin around inside that you can see how big that is i mean these are full-size men that are working on these right so this is a pretty big uh, pretty big machine here i want to point out a couple other things here if we go to the internet there's an here's a uh a nice image I found from the iowaenergycenter.org, right, which again shows us a nice drawing of the components of a horizontal axis turbine. So we can see that the hub is what's used to connect the blades to the shaft, and the main shaft is going to connect the hub 
to the gearbox or the transmission and that transmission has to be then connected to a generator. We also have uh, most of these machines will also have electric or hydraulic over electric brakes so that we can stop this in the event of a storm or a situation where we want the blade to stop immediately. So, and then finally we get to the generator itself. So the generator, there are a couple kinds of generators we can talk about. Um, the first are some of the early turbines that were uh, that were put in service were the wind charger um, and the Jacobs machines, and they used what's known as a DC generator. That DC generator, we can see a picture of that on page 120, and so this is very simple. Um, we have this is just like a uh, a generator that would be in an automobile. So we have to send a field voltage up to be felt on these field windings here. And those field windings then are going to generate a current and a, and a voltage that will be felt uh, through these devices that are known as brushes to send the DC signal back down to the ground where it can be dealt with. And what do I mean by dealt with? Well, it's a DC voltage and it could be used to um, charge batteries or it could be converted directly through what's known as an inverter and the inverter would convert that DC voltage into an AC voltage so that we could use it on the grid or locally. So this is the DC generator. There's another type of that if you keep going over to page 123. This is a Berge machine. Okay, This is the Berge 850. In the Berge 850, uh, again, this is on page 123, we can see some of the uh, um, components uh, taken apart. Uh, this is the uh, field windings, right? And so those windings will have, uh, notice there's one, two, three leads. These windings will generate a three-phased wild AC voltage based on the speed of the spinning rotor. And that spinning rotor, what we can't see here, is right here where I'm pointing. They sometimes refer to this as a magnet can, right? Because it's sort of shaped like a can. And there's magnets around the outside of those. They're known as permanent magnets. And as those permanent magnets move in relationship to this stator winding, S-T-A-T-O-R, stator, because it's stationary, the rotating magnetic field will cause a rotating, a corresponding uh, rotating uh, AC signal to be to, to be developed here. That signal, in this case here, if we look closely, we can see that the slip ring assembly has looks like it's got one, two different uh, connections. So which means that we're going to rectify or to convert the AC voltage into a DC voltage and send the DC voltage down uh, to the bottom of the um, tower where it's mounted so that it can, again, either charge batteries or be convert plugged right into an inverter, and the inverter would then generate the AC voltage. So this turbine, because of the three leads that we see here, create a three-phase wild AC. We call it wild because the rotor spins at a variable speed. As the wind blows faster, the turbine goes faster. With the turbine spinning faster, we're going to generate a voltage that is not constant. For that reason, we cannot put that directly on the grid. It has to first be conditioned so that it meets the same voltage and frequency specifications that the grid does. We're going to do that in a couple of ways. Over here on page 125 we're going to see two different terms, a synchronous generator and an induction generator. The induction generators generate the same voltage and frequency as does the grid. So they're ready to just plug right in. 
They can be designed for both a constant speed rotor or a variable speed rotor. So this is the most common way that uh, the large turbines work. Alternately, we can use what's known as a synchronous generator, and that synchronous generator has to go through what we call an inverter. So the inverter converts the three-phase, um, the, the, the inverter takes a DC voltage, which came from the rectified output of the three-phase wild AC. That DC voltage can be adjusted for various levels. Actually, what I meant is designed for various levels. And so then the inverter, as the term applies, it synchronizes the voltage and frequency being provided by the wind turbine to the voltage and frequency that it's trying to match into with the utility or the power line. Notice in this picture it shows excitation or control current. The, the um, one part that not everyone understands when we're looking at, at, at wind turbines is whether or not they'll generate electricity if when connected to the grid the grid goes down. So some turbines can be standalone, meaning they'll have their own batteries that they will charge and they will uh, they won't have any connection to the utility company. Others, if they do connect to the utility company, require that connection to it. So that connection gives the turbine its excitation, which is what this word we see right here, the excitation right here. Okay, So that's pretty important. We have to have that. So those are the types of generators that we're going to have. We're going to have synchronous, the type that use an inverter. We'll have DC. And then lastly, we have the induction generators. This doesn't change if we're using a vertical axis wind turbine or a horizontal axis wind turbine. We still have to have the generator uh, to convert the mechanical rotational energy from the, the, the spinning uh, rotor into an electrical source. So as I said a bit ago, we came up to this screen that talked about lift and drag when referring to how a wind turbine actually operates. So here we are now. A drag type device is like the windmills we've seen of old, the one with lots and lots of blades on it. That's a drag type device. It will never be able to go faster than the wind blowing on it. So it can't capture as much energy. However, the new modern turbines are going to use a lift type device, very similar to what makes an airplane fly. And so because of this, we're going to end up having many less blades, sometimes as low as one, two, or three, most of the time three. And that device, because of the shape of the blades and how they're angled on the rotor itself, will determine just how well they'll be able to capture the energy from the wind. So we're going to see here in a moment that the lift to drag ratio is determined by what we call the angles uh, the blade's angle of attack. So here on the next page, this is an example of what a, a wind turbine blade would look like. And in this case, notice we'll see the wind coming in from the left side here. And as it passes over, uh, the, the amount of distance the wind on the top side of this blade goes is not the same as the distance on the bottom side of the blade. That's just because of the shape here. All right, and so it's going to end up creating a pressure difference. And in this case, there will be two, two types of pressure shown here. One is called drag. And a good way to think about this is uh, we've all, as children or maybe adults, we've stuck our arm out the window of the car. And by having your arm out the window, you can feel that force. If the car's going really fast and you stick your arm out and you turn your hand so that your hand forms a cup into the wind, then it will be pulled back a great deal. And that's an example of what this drag would be. That's the force that wants to push your hand back towards the back of the car. Okay? But if you turn your hand, it's at an angle to where your hand is knifing through the air, then it doesn't push back as far. But you'll notice that there's a point where it's somewhere between uh, tilted a little bit and tilted a lot, and we're going to get this, this 
uh, phenomenon known as lift, and your hand is going to be pulled up as you're going as you're going down the road. So as it says here on wind in the wind power book on page 97, we see this image here. All right, and so this is the image we're talking about on page 97. So let's look at this one a little bit closer. So what Paul is showing us here, which is different from the screen before, is that the surface wind isn't blowing at the at the front leading edge of this blade, but instead it's blowing what it looks like the bottom part of the blade. Well, as it turns out, this is the front of the blade. So the wind speed is going to go this way. When we look above this, they're going to show a vectoral analysis here. Right? Let me make this a pointer instead of a hand. So they're going to show a, a, vector, a vectoral analysis of the forces of the wind. And, uh, and again, if the wind was blowing straight up, as we see in this page, the the drag would be it would continue following the same direction as as the force of the wind, but because of this blade, the wind direction is going to be um, deflected, and some of it will be deflected around this way, others will be deflected around this way, and we're going to see that 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 drag gets pushed back this way, and it's at ninety degrees to lift. And so again, if we can change the angle at which this blade is pitched into the wind, we can control the amount of lift and compare that to the amount of drag. And notice also the most important part here is this is the direction of the blade travel right here. So the blade is going to be pushed this direction, right? Just as, the, as this lift does this. So this is really important because we're going to learn how we can use this angle to control the speed of the blades in the event we get in a high wind situation or in the event we get in a low wind situation, we can change the blade pitch so that it will start in low wind and then change the pitch back as the, as the wind increases. This is a, there's a lot of science involved in this and we're not really going to get a whole lot deeper into it than this. Um, but again, it's important to notice that Paul is showing the wind coming in this way and which causes the blade to move if we were looking at this um, well, I've got one other thing I want to show you here on the internet. One second here. Notice this this shot here. So this is from a, another web page, and there's plenty of pages. There's no lack of web pages showing how this stuff works. But notice it's showing they're showing the wind uh, coming in from the left to the right. Well, that's not really what's happening here. The wind is coming in more like Paul showed us on the previous page, right? But uh, I did want to show you this page because it showed us this by changing the pitch. We're going to see how the lift gets smaller. Here the lift is large and the drag is small. Here the lift is small and the drag is large because of how we've changed the pitch can also see, notice the blue lines above on this side, this is the one causing the lift, and this is the part of the drag here. And so the wind that has to go this way is going to be at a different pressure than this here. And this is all done by, used by changing what is commonly referred to as the angle of attack. All right, there's quite a bit to read there in the textbook on this, but it should help you uh, understand it. Let's go back to the PowerPoint now. And talk about some of the phrases that are referred to on page 97. Apparent wind is what's seen by the blade. This angle of attack, we said, was in respect to the apparent wind. And by changing the apparent wind, we will change the, alter, uh, the angle of attack. All right. Now, another term we're going to see is a term known as tip speed ratio. And it's just like it says, it's the relationship between the blade tip speed and the wind speed. Oftentimes this is confused. This is not comparing the blade tip speed to the, to the root of the blade. So the tip is the part way out on the end um, and towards the center of the, uh, of the rotor hub. The distance that the blade has to turn is a lot smaller on the inside, and that's because of the circumference. Um, but that's not what we're talking about when, we, when we're talking about tip-speed ratio. We're comparing this, how fast that tip is going compared to the wind that's moving it. And tip-speed ratios are, are, really important, are really important, especially on smaller turbines. The three turbines I showed you before, um, those turbines, the smallest one that had the three-foot 
uh, rotor diameter, when that is operating at maximum performance, its tip speed ratio is very, very high, and that results in this disadvantage shown here as a very high uh, amount of noise. Um, we've got two turbines set up down at the Fort Atkinson campus. One is a is a Berg EXL, which is a thousand watt turbine, and the other turbine is a permanent turbine that's up there. It's a hundred kilowatt machine, and it turns significantly slower. And when you stand next to both of them, you can hear the distinct uh, sound differences between the two of them. So blade pitch, we've talked uh, a bit about that. Most turbines have a fixed pitch. We, we cannot change it, and that's the case with both of our turbines, with both the 100-kilowatt machine and the 1,000-watt and the uh, machine, uh, or 1-kilowatt machine. So both of those, those are, are fixed-pitched, and we cannot change them. Uh, there are some small ones. Uh, for example, we're going to see a picture later in the book that's uh, of a of a Berge. I'm sorry, not a Berge, but a Jacobs machine, and it has what's known as a flyball mechanism, and that's used to change the pitch to um, help control it in high wind situations. So most of the time, changing pitch is only going to be done on larger turbines. This is an example of. Uh, uh, a couple people at Lakeshore Technical College, that's Mick Sagrillo and uh, Jenny Heinzen, and they're manually bolting the blades, blades onto a Vestas V15. And uh, these have to be put on and adjusted before they're put in. Um, and what's important is that all three of the blades must be uh, done correctly. Uh, if there's any imbalance between them, and then you're going to have some real problems. Once they're, these are, were bolted down and tightened, they don't get changed again. So you want to check that two or three times before you have the crane lifted up there. So the medium wind turbines, which are uh, are sometimes it's a it's a the term a medium wind turbine is a, is a difficult one to define because especially uh, in the case of ever growing capacities for turbines. They're getting bigger and bigger. What was once known as a large turbine is now definitely a, a medium turbine. So the turbine we've got in Fort Atkinson, the Northwind 100, uh, that could that is right on the low edge of uh, medium turbines by some definitions. By others, it's just at the high end of a small residential turbine. So um, nothing really hard and fast as far as these definitions go. But one of the things that happens on most of these turbines is that the airfoils themselves are going to stall. And by stall, that, that's like if an uh, airplane pilot was uh, pulled up on the, on the controls too much and, the, and, and increased the angle of attack, like we saw on that screen before, um, the, the plane would try to, would try to um, rise too quickly and it would stall. It would stop going up and they literally fall out of the sky. So that's what happens on an airplane. On a wind turbine what happens is is it the aerodynamics of the blade cause the blade to have some turbulence and it ends up protecting the rotor and the turbine itself because it slows down. Uh, twist and taper. Uh, I'm going to go back to Paul's book here for a second. I'm going to go back here to this page, right? And so what we're looking at on this diagram is is a segment of one chunk of the blade. Well, we don't know where we're looking at it. Are we looking at it at the very tip? Are we looking at it at the root? You know, well, just exactly where are we looking? So I'm going to go to the next page here, hopefully, and I want to show you a picture. Well, we'll do it this way then. of what the blade looks like at various segments, right? So as we look at this, we're going to see that down here, if we were to look right here and slice the blade in half, we could see what the twist is like here as compared to the twist all the way out here on the end. So we have um, this twist is put in here so that down here at the bottom, we have this large sail area, and that's able to grab a lot of the low speed wind to get it going, to get the rotate, to get the rotor spinning in the first place. And then as the, as the speed of the rotor increases, um, 
then we're going to get more effect by the twist that occurs out here. So remember, each every segment along here, not just the six or seven that are shown here, uh, but e along every segment of here, we're going to have those forces of lift and drag uh, all, all along. So again, the angle of attack needs to decrease as you move up uh, from the hub to the blade tip, and the twist is maximum near the hub and, uh, and minimum at the blade tip. And again, this is in order to get the, the machine to start. So I mentioned this a little earlier. It's the solidity piece. How solid is the rotor? Well, the first windmills that maybe we all remember seeing were these old farm windmills. Now, these devices, like we learned about in the early chapters, they're drag devices, and they're de designed to develop a high amount of torque. And that torque is important for what these machines were designed to do. These machines were designed to pump water or to grind uh, grain or do other similar work. And so we need a large amount of torque to do that work. I'm going to go back again to Paul's book, and um, I'm going to go back two pages right here. Again, notice we talked about drag. Drag went in this direction. Lift went in this direction. Notice the torque. Torque moves in the same direction that the blade rotates. Here's the torque right here. It's important to know that. So, the turbine on the left has high solidity. The turbine on the right has low solidity. The one on the right will be far more capable of having a higher tip speed ratio, and, and the rotor will be able to spin uh, much faster than the wind causing it to rotate. Um, to, as Paul writes in the book, um, this idea of more blades being better, if you took that to its uh, infinite degree, what if you made the entire blade what if every bit of the surface was covered with blades and there were no space in between them? Well, then there would have no, we would have, the wind couldn't get through and it wouldn't spin at all. So there comes a, a, a there is a limit to this. So the lower the solidity, the higher the efficiency that we're going to have. The higher the solidity, the more torque we'll get and the more of that type of work we'll be able to perform. So, greater solidity, greater torque. Farm, farm windmills, uh, again, we said are material intensive and they have a lot of drag, and the low solidity reduces the rotor's ability to start spinning on its own. You'll see in the book there are some examples of two and one bladed rotors. Two bladed rotors, there are a few manufactured. Most companies go with three. So, most small turbines are variable speed and they have a fixed pitch. Some of the small commercial ones are known as, as medium turbines, have a constant speed and but a fixed blade pitch, and most of the large turbines are variable speed and also variable blade pitch. This slide uh, speaks also to what we were talking about with the solidity. Um, believe it or not, a single blade captures less energy than uh, uh, than two blades. It, it calls for a very strong blade with a counterweight. There's no sense in spending much time on this because they, they, they don't exist commercially. Uh, the two-bladed machines, like I said, they, they don't make very many of them, but we do have a, a balance issue with them. Uh, one company that makes them, there's an 11 kilowatt machine named uh, the company's Gaia, G-A-I-A, -A, and uh, that, that machine um, it has it has another way to control itself, um, because if we're not going to have the blades pitch in order to slow them down, or be uh, aerodynamically designed so that they will um, flutter and uh, and stall, then we have to have a, another way to slow the the machine down in the event the wind blows too hard. And uh, one of those ways is using what's known as tip brakes. And uh, the Gaia uses these tip brakes, and they can give you what's known as a nuisance trip, because if they flop out, then you're going to lose the aerodynamics of the blade and you'll lose performance. So again, most of the time, we're going to have three bladed rotors that are far more stable and capture uh, more energy than the one or two bladed machines. Blades can be made of wood, 
or metal or fiberglass. The Bergie we looked at uses a blade that's, that's they call it pultruded. It's a fiberglass that gets pulled through a, an extrusion process. Um, some of the early blades were made of metal. Um, I had a very early turbine that had, um, it, it was pretty much like an airplane wing. It had an aluminum frame with uh, heavy gussets and an aluminum skin put over the top of it. And uh, the thing lasted 30 some years. It was prone to uh, fatigue, and by fatigue we mean they can crack, um, and they're heavy, and because they're heavy that causes bearing issues on the uh, on the rotor. Fiberglass and carbon fiber uh, are both very light, they're very strong, and uh, we're seeing more and more uh, uh, compounds of this available. So these are the blade types. The drivetrains themselves. The direct drive machines uh, like the one, the Northwind 100 that we have, which we'll get a chance to see when we go on our, our field trip later this semester. Uh, it has no transmission. It's very simple. Um, there's we, we don't have to speed it up. The output of it is able to um, connect the signal. In this case, this is a, uh, a synchronous inverter type machine, so it turns the wild uh, three-phase AC into a DC, and that DC gets converted into the correct AC. So direct drive, no drivetrain, no, and so we have the rotor connected right to the generator. Most of the large machines, and I mean 95%, nine, probably higher than that, are going to have some sort of a transmission in them. A transmission just like you would see in a machine shop or in a, or in a, in a uh, heavy industry. Um, and so we're going to have the blade turning at one speed, and we have to then increase that speed so that the induction generator will turn at the RPM that it needs. Um, so uh, the note that we see here, the LTC gearbox ratio is 1.22 to 24. That's right. So it's a for every turn of the blade, the rotor, there are 22.4 turns of the generator shaft. So that gearbox, it's important that it has it is maintained well because it's doing a lot of work and there is some loss in the energy conversion process. So we want to make sure that it's uh, well maintained. The transmissions, of course, make them a little noisier, and uh, uh, which is always then going to be an issue. So I've talked about generators before, and here's a little uh, wrap-up of it. I felt like it was important to list it first. So the generator is uh, is going to convert the moving the physical movement of the wind into a physical movement of a coil through an uh, through an electromagnetic field. Whether that electromagnetic field comes from a permanent magnet or some sort of electromagnetic uh, electromagnets that have a field winding put on them. And there's three ways that we can in increase the size of it. We can increase the size of the wire. We can increase the strength of the magnetic field with bigger permanent magnets or with more windings on the field. Or we can change the speed. And then lastly, as, we, as I mentioned early on, that there are, um, there are both DC generators and then there are also AC generators. Those of you that had DC-AC circuits have uh, done a little bit of study on this already. And if you haven't had any electricity courses yet, you may want to do that to get a better understanding of how the wind generators work. Induction generators, right out of the box, make a, a in the case of the United States, a uh, utility voltage level ready which could be 480 volts, it could be 240 volts, it could be larger voltage, uh, but they operate at the 60 hertz uh, or 60 cycles per second frequency that, that the grid operates on. So we don't need an inverter on this one. Uh, they're, they're actually pretty uh, inexpensive uh, because they are so common. It's nothing really more than a motor, and when I cause a motor to turn faster, than the voltage that's causing it to move, then I actually pump energy back down the wires that the motor was being driven by, and then I'm making a generator. Pretty simple. More wind, more torque equals more power. I want to make sure you read what Paul has to say about, about voltage slip, because there is a little bit of slippage, and he puts some, some figures in here that uh, that you'll want to read about and uh, if you have any questions on that just let me know. Governing. 
I've talked a bit about changing blade pitch so that we could keep the turbine to go from going too fast. I also talked about flutter. Okay, when the turbine is going so fast that the uh, that the physical construction of the blades might cause them to vibrate, and if they're vibrating, they're they're not going to turn as smoothly, and that will affect the lift and the drag that they're feeling. Um, we can ha also have this aerodynamic stall as the as the rotor goes faster and faster. Uh, the the twist of the blade will cause it to uh, literally slow down, similar to the way uh, an airplane stalls. We also have mechanical brakes. Mechanical brakes are um, just what it sounds like. Step on the brakes, and, and a hydraulic cylinder uh, is going to push a pad against a, rot a rotating disc, and uh, those can be used in an emergency case most of the time. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, me another mechanical brake, or an, I'm sorry, the aerodynamic brakes. Those would be like tip brakes, okay? And those tip brakes flip out and uh, and ruin the aerodynamics of the machine. There's a, uh, a, a turbine in the book made by a company called Proven. Proven is a Scottish company that went out of business a few years ago and was purchased by another company named Kingspan. And Kingspan still has, uh, they've reintroduced their machines, their Proven machines, back into the business. And so you can buy a Proven, and it, it's unique in that it has a coning effect to slow it down. It's also what's known as a downwind machine. And by downwind, I mean that the wind travels across the body of uh, the generator before it hits the blades. Almost everything we've looked at now, up till now, the wind first hit the blades before it hit the uh, the generator on the machine. So the uh, the Proven uses this type of coning, and I want you to take a look at page uh, 134 of your book. There's a figure uh, uh, 6-45 that shows the unique blades that the Proven machine uses. And again, the ones that we see, Mick. Uh, um, in the picture with uh, this was for the this was for the proven machine and it's exactly the same machine that's now being marketed by a company called Kingspan still out of Scotland so the one thing I didn't talk about was this thing called furling furling right here furling can either be horizontal or it can be vertical and uh, that's covered in the same area where uh, where we saw that picture of Mick there and so what furling does is let's see if it's going to tell me this. All right, I'm going to go back to the book. I'm going to flip over to page 131. All right. Oh boy, that's going to take a minute to get there. Oh, that was Mick right there. Bear with me. All right, this is a, a good picture to show us what we're trying to do. So, um, page 131. So what ends up happening is, in this case, you can see the rotor here. And this is the tail. This is known as, let me go back and look here one more time, yaw. All right, we're going to talk about yaw before we talk about furling. It makes sense to do this. Uh, yaw is the ability to keep the wind pointed, to keep the wind, so that's, to keep the wind turbine pointed into the wind. That's the way we're going to be able to capture the most amount of energy. To use passive yaw, which is shown here on this slide, we're going to use the aerodynamic forces to orient the rotor with the wind. And by that, we'll use tail vanes or tail fins. And this is mostly used on smaller machines. So again, back on page 131, that's what the tail does. The size of this tail is important because this tail is going to keep, keep it so that this rotor point, points directly into the wind. Now here on this page, we're going to see that the wind continues to blow in this direction regardless 
of, of which of the three images we're looking at. What ends up happening is that when the wind gets going too fast, this tail is going to get pulled over. Notice here, if we were to look down directly from above it, that that it's uh, it's perpendicular, or I'm sorry, it's uh, yes, it's perpendicular to this angle here that we've got a 90 degree angle between there. Well, when the wind gets blowing, the there's a hinge mechanism right here called a furling mechanism, which is going to pull the tail uh, either toward us into the page here, and but the tail then stays facing into the wind. So what ends up happening is the rotor face itself, as it's spinning, no longer faces into the wind. The wind isn't striking on the, on the blades here. It's only striking the blades along the side. It would be as though you put your hand, as though you lifted your hand in out of the wind. All right? So we're literally taking the rotor right out of the wind. So this is an example of how um, we've decreased the frontal area that's facing the wind. There's a couple ways of doing this, and on the next page, um, oh, it didn't like what I, oh, no. bear with me. All right. So we have an African wind power machine up here, and if we look closely, this is the yaw mechanism on it. Notice that it's at an angle here. The reason behind this is when, when this tail mechanism folds over, like the hinge that it is, and the rotor falls out of the wind, we don't. it needs to rise up so that as the wind dies down, that it can go back to its natural perpendicular relationship with the with the rotor. On the bottom of this page we show yet another way of doing it and this is um, on what's known as a as a HR3 okay and uh, this device furls it, it it lifts when the wind gets going so strong it pushes the rotor up so it's no longer facing directly into the wind and again this disc is no longer capturing all the air so those are two different ways of furling. So, back to our, our screen here. Yawing is how we keep the wind turbine pointed into the wind. The other way of doing this are on our larger turbines, and I mentioned this before, is we use, um, we use anemometers and, and wind vanes to measure the wind and determine which direction the wind is coming from and then there's an electro electrical most of the time, or a hydraulic system that's going to engage a motor along a ring gear to point the turbine directly into the wind. This is the most common way that we do this, and it's why we see most of the large turbines don't have the big long tails on the end of them. So again, here's the horizontal furling. So, and they call this overspeed protection. The tail swings either towards um, or above the rotor. In some cases, in the Jacobs machine, there's a hand crank that you can turn that pulls the tail over it at a 90 degree angle so that, the, so that when the wind blows, the tail will follow the wind, but the rotor will be 90 degrees out of the wind and it can't spin very well. It will, will generate no electricity. This is that vertical, the same picture that we saw before, uh, actually slightly different than we saw on what, page 132. Oh, here's the same picture of Mick um, uh, on page uh, 134. And so the way this Bergie works is by coning. The, there's springs, which you can't see in this picture here. There was on an earlier page, but there are springs which... Um, 
allow those blades to work on this hinge. And you can see the hinge right here. Mick is, uh, is actually actuating one. Um, worked pretty well. Another way to slow them down is this device called feathering. And by, we're just basically going to be changing lift and torque by changing the uh, surface blade exposed to the wind. And one of the ways we do that is with um, um, one of the ways that uh, the, the Jacobs machine do that. We'll see that. Let's see. I don't think we have anything there. We're going to go to page 136 of the book and show you that Jacobs machine. Boy, this is not responding well. One page. Oh. This has not been a very good video. Okay, so this is one of the types of Jacobs machines that uh, I've worked on a little bit. And there's two different ways of doing this. This is the one that's known as the flyball generator. And as this thing spins too quickly, the weight of these balls gets flung out through its centrifugal force. And that centrifugal force is going to act on the on this mechanism. You can see the angle here, and it's going to change the shaft angle. By changing that shaft angle or the pitch, we're going to see that it won't be able to capture as much energy. Notice the gears here, right? So, uh, gears means where. They also have a blade actuated one. Same thing. Now these uh, are, there are many, many of these in existence uh, around the world. Um, and uh, this is a Jacobs uh, 1731, uh, 17 foot diameter, uh, rated at 31 kilowatts. Um, pretty strong machines. Um, what you can just barely see in this picture here is a shining shaft, right? See that shaft shining right there? That is a shaft that slides inside this blade about, oh, this far. And it has to be greased nicely because it has to pitch. And these springs need to be adjusted with these uh, adjustable eye bolts. And so they need to be adjusted so that all three of them spin at the, uh, or, or tilt at the same rate. But again, it's mechanical. A lot of moving parts, not very fun to work on. Well, actually, no. It's a lot of fun to work on, but um, can be some. There can be some challenges associated with it. They don't make these new anymore, but there is a company that rebuilds them. Okay. Uh, again, we talked about brakes. Um, uh, we'll want to slow these down if we know there's a big wind event coming. Then a lot of times we'll secure the turbine, get it shut off completely. Um, and, and, but one of the best ways to slow them down is to change the angle of the uh, of the blades. Uh, but of course, that's all part of the design. Uh, so uh, this is yet another thing. We've got a small handheld generator that we use, um, and which works very well for demonstrating what would happen if we shorted all three legs of the three-phase wild AC system. Now in this picture, this is what we call a tilt-up tower, right? And in this tilt-up tower, we can see the guy wires this way, and there's going to be some more over here. Um, and the voltage just runs up the center of the tower, and it feeds into this, this um, it's a three-phase disconnect. And when we close that disconnect, two things happen. One, the AC signal that's coming up through one of these that AC signal gets disconnected. And number two, those fuses really aren't fuses. Uh, in many cases, they're just literally pieces of pipe that are used to short all three legs of the turbine together. And uh, again, if we had our, our demonstration device, our hand crank wind turbine, um, we demonstrate this quite well. And we'll I'll make sure that's with us when we go on our field trip. So we talked a lot about many different types of uh, turbines. Uh, we did not do the book justice. We did not talk very much about uh, 
uh, vertical axis wind turbines. Um, this subject is, uh, is pretty big, so we're going to use the rest of week five and all of week six to talk about and learn about wind turbine uh, construction and what works and what doesn't work. There will be a worksheet that you have to do. You'll have to find some terms and get the definitions for them. And then we'll also open up some discussions so you can do some research on different types of turbines and, uh, and learn what kind of information is available there. So that's it. And um, enjoy your reading. You've got, uh, I think this is a pretty big chapter. It seems like there's uh, right around 60 pages to read here. So um, 